Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. And this is episode number two, eight, three, dos, ocho, tres, dos, ocho, tres. Como estas, mi amigos? Bien. I'm feeling amazing. As you can tell, I'm over the moon. I'm on top of the um I'm on top of the world, right over the moon on top of the world, floating in the sky, right? Or something like that. I don't know. Whatever it is, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling fine. Hope you guys are feeling the same. If you're listening via the audio podcast, you might have heard a little jingle that I'm starting to play at the beginning of the audio podcast that you'll obviously hear only if you're subscribed to the podcast via Apple or Spotify or any other you know podcasting platform that you use at the moment. So definitely click that link below and subscribe to my podcast when you hear a little jingle that I have playing in the beginning. Um, of, if you're familiar with hip-hop, you would know where this song's come from. If you're not, then you just think it's a sick jingle that I made. Unfortunately, I did not make the track, but it was remade by somebody else on YouTube that happened to kind of rip because the person said it was free to use. So now I've used that as my jingle. So let me know what you think about the jingle. Let me know if you think it works, if it's a bit corny, if it's not too cool, whatever it may be. Um, get on that podcast. Subscribe via Apple. You'll find the links down below in the description box of all the links to subscribe via pod via Spotify and Apple for the most part. It's what I mainly use. So definitely check down below. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Also, follow me on social media if you haven't already. Um, I'm on Instagram at AgostinoZinger, um, AgostinoZinger, all one word. And I'm also on Twitter at AgostinoZinger, all one word. I'll put the links below in the show notes or i might have actually pop them up here somewhere on the video so you guys can see and get in touch so how have i been how have i been i've been good man i've been good um the last couple of weeks have been a uh, very strenuous i have to admit uh, i've been running a lot i've been doing a lot of running so um last week i think i ran monday to friday right every day monday to friday which was a flipping horror show um i did about 15 miles i think last week let me see if i can find it on my strava um, it's been helped a lot because I've been running home from work a few times. I work near like the Liverpool Street, Olga East area. So it's, uh, from that bit to basically Stratford is about three miles, point three point eight miles. If I run from that place exactly all the way to home, it'll be about four miles. So I can get a four mile running, just running back from work a couple of times a week. So that's not too bad. Um, so yeah, so last week I did, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did something like, uh, 15 miles. This week is probably going to be about 10 to be completely honest but i'm feeling good i'm feeling stronger it's very difficult like i said previously i still maintain that running outside is 10 times more difficult than going to the gym doing pilates doing yoga. maybe yoga is probably the most i'd say is similar to running because of the positions they're having to hold and the fact that most of your mobility is most of your most of what you can do in yoga is limited by your mobility if your mom if your if your if your if your limbs are mobile and you can put yourself in different positions, you'll do more. If not, you just won't do it. But it would then hurt for you to be in those positions because obviously you have to uh, train your limbs to kind of sit in those positions and obviously the teacher won't let you. Because every yoga class I've been to, the instructors are flipping amazing. They don't let up. Do you know what I mean? They can spot people who are taking breaks who are like, you know, putting their elbow down or resting or just not doing it properly. And they'll always kind of, you know, kick you up to ask for it. So you have to be on your P's and Q's. Obviously with running, especially if you're, that's the defense I've heard of people that say, that prefer running on treadmills because they say if you're running on a treadmill it's a consistent pace you have to keep up there is no like coasting whereas when you're running on the street you can sprint for a bit and then you can just coast for a bit and plod along and then sprint and plod along isn't it? but you can't necessarily do that when you are running on a treadmill which i understand to some extent but you know i still don't think it's correct because i think the fact that you're having to run on uh different kind of planes you're having to navigate around traffic you're having to speed up and slow down. Sometimes you might get a little bit of a chip in your shoulder because the bus is coming past you and you might want to race a bus. These things kind of help in terms of kind of increasing your overall endurance. And I still maintain that um, running on a treadmill, there is, I think you can you can transfer your skills running on the street or running on the road to running on a treadmill. Like if you run regularly on, outside, you'll probably be fine to run on the treadmill like a true form. You'll be fine. But I always kind of, my assumption is that people that run excessively on the treadmill aren't necessarily the strongest runners when they go on the road. It's not a, the transferable skill that you'd think. It doesn't work both ways. Um, but I've been having a lot of fun with it. I'm getting back to where I was before. Uh, when I was at my peak, I was just running all the time. I was signing up to every single race I could find. Now I'm just training more just to kind of get my base where I need it to be. And then I'm going to sign up to some few, a few more races. 
my running regime might get a bit interrupted because I'm going to Berlin next week. So that might interrupt kind of my overall process of what I do. But, you know, what can you do? Um, no, sorry, I'm going to Berlin the week after, not next week, the week after. So um, that might kind of uh, impact where I go and how I do it. Um, but apart from that, you know, what else I've been doing? That's it really, isn't it? Running, being clean actually. I've not had any alcohol, any drugs actually for about two weeks now. So that's been pretty cool. Um, it's quite nice, isn't it? I, I'm, a few people say it all the time and you, you always end up sounding like a cracker when you say stuff like this. But it's fairly um, it's fairly enjoyable waking up in the weekend and not having a hangover. Like being hangover free in the weekend is beautiful. Like honestly, you get so much done. Especially with all the stuff I have going on anywhere in my life and trying to get my mental health back where it needs to be, trying to get my career where it needs to be, trying to make sure I'm doing my side hustles to the point that I need to do them, right? There's loads of things I'm currently not doing at the moment that would be aided if I had a clear mind, right? And a clear heart and a clear way to kind of express myself. And, you know, it's not necessarily helped by in to- um, kind of taking on board those kind of, you know, drugs, those kind of vices and shit because they don't really help. They help sometimes in the short run, don't get me wrong. I think no one can deny that if you're having a tough day and someone hands you a glass of scotch on the rocks, right, or neat um, and a nice cigar, I'm sure for, uh, you know, the briefest of moments, you'll feel bliss. You'll be like, oh, finally, right? What a great day this is going to be out. But when you, as soon as that scotch is finished, as soon as that kind of buzz wears off, you're, you're done for, isn't it? I wish they could do that. I wish they could um, make some kind of drink. Maybe that's what wine is, isn't it? maybe they could make a drink that could you know when you're drinking beer and you get that buzz you get the good little you get the good buzz like the i'm i'm tipsy or i'm a bit giddy i'm a bit giddy but i'm not drunk i wish you could just have a drink that made you have that feeling or sustained it for a period of time because what ends up happening is that you end up hitting a point of no return right you end up trying to chase that buzz and then it ends up kind of falling off a cliff and then you end up getting blacked out and then suddenly your friends are having to order you an uber home and you're covered in someone else's vomit not my story not my story but yeah, I wish they someone could do that. I guess that's why um people prefer going out to like Mediterranean countries. Or that's why people from Mediterranean have better relationship when it comes to alcohol and beverage. I've, I've say all the time to people that are from Spain and stuff like who always kind of are a bit bewildered by how um, fucked up we get as a nation in the UK on drugs and alcohol. I always say that it's not really our fault, in it really. To be honest, like the way the the way the bar cultures and pubs are or clubs are designed. It's, even pubs we got some of the best pubs around especially in the area that i live in east london some great pubs right from the brunch from the big franchises to the small independent ones there's everything that you want right to this, to the kind of like you know sketchy um eastern european ones that are popping off on the weekends they have little club nights they have day like we have some really good bars and pubs in this area but the issue is that for the most part you are chucked out of those establishments at like what 11 12 p 12 a.m maybe at the latest right um and for most people, that's just when you're about to get started, right? You're revving up. So what ends up happening is like people end up changing their drinking patterns, right? To kind of fit in with what's going on in terms of pub, bars and pubs. Because, you know, you can only work with what you got. So now people are leaving work earlier or having boozy lunch, especially on a Friday, especially if it's a payday weekend. They'll have like a boozy lunch. So you're already intoxicated. Then they'll finish work earlier. Then they might have a couple of drinks at work because sometimes most offices have like, you know, some kind of offices, office manager or HR person or uh, company or kind of, you know, um, what's the thing called them? Wellness or happiness kind of coordinator who kind of organizes all these events and they kind of go out of their way to make sure, you know, the working environment is as um, is as enjoyable as possible to kind of get the best out of everyone so people can, you know, hit their targets, the business can make more money, blah, blah, blah. It's a good, it's a good um, thing. So they'll go out their way to make sure everyone's supplied with drinks, maybe get some liquor, maybe get some wine, some beers. You have a couple there. Then you go meet up your other friends, your friends outside of work, right? Um, and then they might meet you up early because they finish their work early too. You end up going to a nice little trendy bar somewhere in the Liverpool Street. It's only 7 p.m. now. You've already had a boozy lunch. You've had maybe a couple at your desk, a couple after work, quote unquote, around the um, kitchen area, and then some on your way to the pub and then some at the pub. You've maybe had like five occasions already where you're already kind of boozed up. And then by the time you start to realize or start to maybe kind of contemplate um, going out somewhere else, you are absolutely levered. And it's only 11 o'clock, it's only 10 p.m. How many times, I, I can't speak for myself, but have you ever been out sometimes after work and you've, and you've looked at your watch and you're like, bloody hell, it's only 10 p.m. Because it feels like you've been out for ages. Why? Because you've left work early on a Friday and then you've all got drunk together and you're still drunk out now. And it's like, you look at the watch and it's like, especially when it's summer, 
and it's still light outside. Yeah, like, Jesus Christ, it's only 8 p.m. and you've had like I don't know 17 pints. So I think, but and again, I, I'm not really sure why as a country we don't change it because antisocial behavior, especially on the weekend, goes up a lot. The police, the police, policemen and women have to put up with some absolute nonsense. The ambulance and medical services have to kind of pick up people that fall in gutters and stuff. It's a real waste of resources. Like they could really do. They could really do a lot of good, but again, I think we're so babied in this country, like, any little fun thing. Do you remember when yo-yos came in to train in schools and they just banned them because kids were getting injured and stuff? Like, some kids were getting injured, right? Kids that didn't have to use them, or some dumb kids, right? Don't get me wrong, but most kids enjoyed using yo-yos. They banned them. Hoverboards, banned. Scooters, banned. Everything fun that got introduced in the UK. I remember when I was in school, they just kept banning stuff. We're just such a baby, the molly-coddled um, country. So it's just so annoying. The best thing would be to, like, kind of, I think, just in general, just to, just a trial in some areas, especially some of the more high risk areas, right? Let's say like central London, bit parts of central London, parts of Liverpool Street, Old Street, Angel, Clapham, Brixton, right? Those places where like, you know, on the weekend stuff starts getting popping off. Just extend the pub hours by a couple. That's it. I'm not saying keep them up until six like Berlin, because that's not gonna happen with the culture. We're a bit too funny, fuddy daddy for that stuff. But let's just imagine your local pub in your area, right? The one that you go to sometimes with your family for a Sunday roast. Let's imagine on the Friday, it's open until 2 a.m. Or 3, heaven forbid, right? What ends up happening there? Like, you can end up having actual, an actual boozy um, evening out with your mates. They end up getting a DJ to play or there's a live band in there, right? You end up staying and having a good time and you end up actually saving money because you don't have to go to Fabric or go to, you know, whatever to go and party. You can just stay in your area, you can walk home. There's no need to kind of, you know, drink, drive. You can get Uber back. It's going to cost you like tenner at most, right? It's done. Like it's, it kind of really, it settles you down. And I think that's what, that's essentially the the beauty of bars and nightlife culture in Berlin, I'd imagine. Because everything's open so late, there's no rush. There's no need to kind of frantically get places. I always feel as if here, we're always trying to, I remember even for myself, when I used to live at home, I used to put on nights in Dawson. I used to go out a lot in Dawson and Shoreditch. Like, I'd actually, I'd have to run home. Like, but that was especially the time I was working at Dr. Martin's, right? I'd have to, I was working at Dr. Martin's, what, that was the first flagship store in Carnaby Street. I'd be at Carnaby Street, I'd, especially when I was supervisor, I'd have to lock up, cash up, which is annoying, right? I was horrible at cashing up because my maths is, you know, down the toilet. I have to cash up. Um, luckily, I, I'd had, like, I had already, like, cool, trendy hipster clothes on because I'm working at Dr. Martin's, right? So, i run home, um, have a little, you know, Puerto Rican shower, right, in the sink, um, rush out, and then I have to kind of rush out, go do my stuff, whatever I'm, I was going to go do, right, and then I have to kind of get out of my house before, I don't know, 10 p.m. to make it worthwhile, because by the time I leave, let's say, my family's home at Canning Town to go to central London, it's about, it's about, oh no, go to central east, whatever that is, right, in Dawson and Shoreditch and stuff, and Hackney, it's about a 45 minute journey, right, maybe tops 40 minutes, um, so you have to really put that into context, so if you leave at 11, you're essentially only giving yourself three hours to party because everywhere closes at like 3 a.m. Unless you've got like a little lock-in and you've got some friends I can invite you in and stuff. But mostly, you're having to really race around to get to places to kind of enjoy any kind of occasion. And then what ends up happening? You end up being too revved up. You're too on it, right? Do you know what I mean? That's the one thing you hear about Berlin or Bergheim. Oh, what? Just don't don't be too excited in a, in a queue. Like, relax, chill out, all that sort of stuff. Why? Because it doesn't really... Um, it doesn't really uh, benefit you when you go into the dance floor that you're so amped up and you're screaming and shouting and shit. It's just like annoying, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I don't know, man. Hopefully that changes. It would be nice if the night czar, you know, that Amy Lammy woman had some kind of input in that, but I know probably it's above her pay grade, but Jesus Christ, what has she done since getting that job? Instead of like standing behind like, you know, with a flash beaming inside of her face wearing those silly dresses, you know, in weird functions like I, I i never understood how she got hired for that job to be. was it an open application anyway was it open applications or was she just was she a member of the cabinet anyway or she like a politician beforehand just an incredibly bizarre po- like if you look at every other night czar that is exist in the world especially in europe most of them have like a very deep history or ties to the nightlife scene like actual club life not like because i think she used to do cabaret shows or comedy not like all that kind of alternative shit that happens in like you know some basement bar somewhere in the middle of an angel no i'm talking about actual clubs actual nightclubs actual debauchery right like she wasn't part of any of that stuff she was just you know part of the kind of alternative i don't know comedy improv scene and stuff and suddenly she got a job where she's having an input into the future of some of our most prevalent nightclubs in london it makes no sense does it really i don't know but 
what do I know, innit? What do I know? Anyway, let's get into the show. Today's going to be loads of streetwear news that I haven't spoken about, so I'm going to dive on into that. So if you're uh, streetwear Pacific and you like all that stuff, then definitely get involved. If not, I'm sorry. What can I do for you at this moment? So let's get this up on the screen so we can know what we got to view here. Du, 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 du. Let's see what we've got here. We've got so much stuff to get through. Um, hopefully we have all the time to do it at this occasion so before i start let me quickly log into here and just make sure everything is running smoothly and no one is dying da, 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 da. okay so number one thing i want to talk about is um unfortunately the untimely passing of andrew weverell man like legendary dj from the love hours of our space uh, fame somebody who i kind of looked up to a lot coming up in the scene um and again somebody who i think um didn't maybe get the props that he deserves but i think it was also purposely done i do remember having a feeling that especially when i discovered um andrew everall i think this might have been the time when i was discovering maybe ricardo Lobos and craig richards and stuff and i used to always think this guy's as good as these guys why isn't he on the same platform then obviously when you start reading interviews and you start following him and stuff you start to appear you start to see that oh actually it was a um, conscious effort on his part to not be the superstar dj um quote-unquote selector person um i always said it's a really poor example because i guess um gerd jansen is really is a, a, a is probably a lot younger than he is but i always um saw andrew ever was like our the uk version of a like gerd jansen like a dj's dj somebody that's respected by most djs in the scene who people like other djs respect him a lot when they're playing alongside him right they think okay this guy's a special one right because he does like, because I imagine when you are like a top level DJ, there does come a point where you get a bit cynical. You start to just, you know, phone it in. You just start to play for the crowd. You start to play for the B-Port charts. It just becomes a little bit meh, right? So I can imagine if you're playing alongside Andrew Everall and he's still rocking the dance floor the same as you are because you're playing all the current pop, the, the current house, techno, um, electro, EBM hits but he's just playing all this off kilter stuff that he's found in record stores or stuff that he's got sent or stuff that he's made for the last part, like, which I w was really a big fan of. Like he's, he was a big uh, proponent of like playing a lot of his own music. I think he came from that old school kind of mentality where DJs necessarily all play their own music for the most part. Um, I watched too many interviews of this guy. Like he, he definitely kind of molded the way that I kind of viewed artistry when it comes to DJing. Because I have to admit, when I first got into it, especially when it, cause I, I first got into it for the promoting side, and it was just a, a necessity, right? Because um, we were booking big DJs or booking DJs that cost a lot of money, and there wasn't anyone, we didn't have any other budget left to kind of book support acts. So I just started DJing, right? And then over time, I gained a real love for it. I gained a real ability to do it. I thought, I, you know, I still maintain, I think I'm probably up there with some of the best London DJs out there, especially that I haven't playing as regularly as they should be. Um, but I didn't think there was much artistry to it. I thought there was a lot of skill to it. I thought maybe there was a lot of taste to it, but I didn't think there was a lot of artistry, if you get what I mean, right? But I like the way that Andrew Everall approached DJing as an artist. Like, he, maybe because of his history in Primal Screen, but he definitely approached DJing with a sense of, I don't know, care and craft and love and direction and intention. That's the thing, yeah. Everything, was, everything had an intention behind it. He didn't just do things willy-nilly. It wasn't just for the sake of it. Like, he was just playing around, right? Everything had an intention behind it. And I guess... Um, there's no better way to kind of lay tribute to the man than quickly go over this video that I watched back in the day that I thought was a really good summation of kind of his thoughts and his legacy and what he's kind of about. Um, I'm going to quickly play it here for you guys. Um, and yeah, it's from like 10 minutes, 16, I think on this bit. I'm going to play it for you now. Okay, I'll put it on the screen. Hopefully it starts to play. Let's see. This is, from a, uh, this is a video from uh, Fump. I actually miss Fump, man. It's quite a decent little online magazine, mostly focused on electronic music um, or dance music culture. And unfortunately, it's gone by the wayside. Quite a lot of them are doing the same thing. I think I, I, was, I was saying the other day, I, I think I may start. I think I may start my own little Instagram page or web page that is similar to that for dance music clips. Maybe something similar to like the Music Mag from back in the day. Remember music spelled with a Z. That might be a good way to go about things because I do miss having a place to go to that isn't RA just to kind of get kind of off kilter news and stuff. That would be quite entertaining. Um, or feature some people that are a bit underground, not that well known. I think that'd be quite cool. But anyway, let's quickly just view this and then we can just carry on. I think it's a good tribute for Andrew Everall and kind of talking about what he does, you know. He's obviously the, 
doing a little bit of uh, is it leaner printing with this kind of when you scrape it on and you kind of uh, cover it with the ink I think so let's go to 1016 it's a bit I want to hear da, da, da. Da, da, da. there we go here let me over here still DJing with vinyl? Um, I buy vinyl, I kind, I kind of am. Um, I buy vinyl and I record onto CD because then I have the best of both. I love vinyl but mm. I don't, um, I didn't like lugging 30 kilos of records around Europe at the best of times, uh, even less so now. So you, you get to carry um, a lot of vinyl even although it, you know it's recorded with an analog line onto a CD, CD player. You still get people um, they expect you to expect me to play on vinyl. You get one punter a gig coming up and having a look and kind of looking at you with a kind of disappointing, you know, slight shrug and off they walk. But it's no point trying to lean over and shout, you know, and explain that you do actually support support vinyl. That's the one thing I think is unique about London. I respect. As annoying as it may be, some DJs you can exist. You there is a scene, an industry, an appeal for like. I wouldn't even term it that because I think it's quite disparaging. But for lack of a better term, chin stroker DJs, they like you can make a career out of it. I guess maybe in some other places I think of it. Let's say maybe in Miami, maybe some place like in New York, maybe in some extent um, in LA. You probably can't be a chin stroker DJ. You have to be like a DJ that could play most things. You couldn't just be your own little niche thing, which is why people probably move to places like Berlin and Georgia and shit, right? Um, or to Belize, sorry, or these kind of off kilter places, or maybe places like Lisbon and shit um because you can maybe hone your own little craft maybe israel is a good one but london's uk is more uh, even that bristol keep Brist keep bristol weird video from boy room really kind of expounds on it the fact that you can just get away with you know building a label building a production company building an aesthetic an artistry a direction your dj that is very very specific and you can find very very specific or niche fans that are into that stuff too it doesn't yeah you know i mean it's so cool that's a great thing i think about london Unique in that way. How did you make that step from um, from DJ to producer? Well, again, it was just because I had a good record collection. You know, so I became a DJ because I had a good record collection, and I'd been playing at clubs that people wanted to go to, uh, and those bands were at those clubs. Um, so, it's, you know, the, the ones that I wanted to work with are the ones that went to the club and, what, and were genuinely influenced by the music that I was playing or Paul Lightenfall was playing or Danny Ramplin was, was playing. Uh, um, and um, so it seemed only natural that I would, they would ask me to, to make their, mu their records sound like the records I was playing or they were, they were dancing to. That's why I was bought, you know, I wasn't bought in um, as a technical, you know, it, it was the fact that I knew I was on those dance floors every weekend. That's the knowledge that I was bringing, and, and and the structures and the sounds of those of those records. You know, I had to work with an engineer to 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 realise them. But I wasn't, you know, that same engineer wasn't in DJing in nightclubs every weekend. That's the one thing that I've always kind of taken from him as a lesson. And maybe again, my experience kind of looking at people like Craig Richards, Ricardo Villa Lobos, um, obviously uh, Andrew Weverell, Gerd Janssen, uh, Seth Troxler, a few other, maybe, you know, maybe Dixon in the, in the beginning too, when he first kind of got started in Arm and stuff. I always got the understanding, I always got the kind of feeling that to be a really good DJ, and look at all things, I think uh, it, the, the mantra that sticks in my head is this idea that, you know, I remember when I was doing this whole like CrossFit endurance thing and I was, you know, and the CrossFit endurance program is like a running program that basically tells you that you shouldn't, in order to run longer, don't run, in order to run longer, don't run for long. Like, you know, it's all these little methods where you do like circuit training, you do the kind of drills, everything but running the distance. I remember reading some, a quote that said something along the lines of like, if you want to get better running, you got to run more, right? It's just like a really simple line. And I guess... I always attribute that to DJing too. Like in order to be good at DJing, you have to actually go out and party, right? You have to actually know, you have to kind of have an understanding of what makes a good party to understand how to put on a good party yourself, right? But there is this weird thing. Of, I, I do think maybe in the scene, there is a weird divide between like geeks or people that are just like musically obsessed, right? That can just name you every artist on every track, on every label, every production credit. 
that know when the drop's about to come or, you know, they just know everything, every white label they have, but they don't necessarily go out and party. They're not necessarily fans of dance music culture. They just kind of stay in their little cabin, stay in their little man shed, um, man cave, sorry, play their tunes at home, make banging mixes, do great productions, get booked everywhere and go and play out. But they don't necessarily, there's no joy behind what they're doing about going out. They just like sharing. Maybe they like, the joy comes from maybe sharing the music. But I do like the idea that it, maybe this is fact why I like some people like a Roy Perez or Dr. Rubenstein, who I've kind of discovered in the last few years, uh, Helena Half. Like, they actually enjoy the fact that they're outside, right? Like, that's probably why people really, even though I'm not really a fan of all the hands in the air stuff, like, what I found, I found a girl on Twitter was the same, Alicia, who's like always kind of waving her hands in the air and shit, doing like, it's like a tech house thing, right? Well, you always kind of, you know, like, it's always about you. Like, you're kind of, like, putting it out there that I'm the one that's making this party rock. I do understand the appeal of that tech house kind of uh, 338 uh, scene because, you know, the, pe- the these behind the booth are really enjoying the fact that they are playing records for this crowd that are gurning off their heads and all wearing shades and stuff, right? Um, they're loving it. So I can understand why that would appeal to punters because if you're going to a rave and, you, and you're seeing, a, like, I don't know, a Matthias Tamsin behind a decks or a DJ Hell or like a Ben UFO and he's just like standing there or like a surgeon, right? Just not moving, not showing any level of emotion. It can maybe bum you out as an audience member. Of course, I don't necessarily go to DJ, to clubs to go see a DJ himself perform. I might go and glance and see him. He's there. Oh, he's there. I've got my eyes on him. But I'm not necessarily staring, like looking at him the whole time. I'm just dancing. I'm in my own little zone, isn't it? That's the whole beauty of being... Um, of going out uh, and clubbing and stuff but i do appreciate the fact that there are people like andrew weverell who do exist right who kind of approach it from the idea of like no i'm a fan of music first that's where my love for it comes this is where my uh, uh, expertise comes from and this is a lesson i've kind of carried on with me to be honest obviously it can get a little bit too crazy you can maybe go a little bit you can maybe go uh, over the top somewhat in terms of the amount of times you do go out and stuff and you can sometimes get lost in the source but I think overall, I'm a big fan of the idea that, you know, in order to get better, in order to kind of get a better understanding, in order just to kind of, you know, develop your taste, it's good to kind of go out to a lot of stuff. And I go out to a lot of events, especially some of the bigger events, you know, from big promoters and some of the smaller stuff, because, you know, it's the best way to kind of get involved and get be a part of the scene. I, I, no, I, no, I, I think half the, the attraction for, for art for me was its lack of respectability. You know, especially being brought up in the suburbs, um, which was, you know, I didn't have a bad upbringing, but it, it was the suburbs, and it, it was it was quite monochromatic, um, and all the colour seemed to be coming from people that that um, weren't that respectable. <laughs> David Bowie on top of the pops doing Starman, that old suburban cliche, you know, that wasn't deemed particularly respectable just after tea time in 1972, and the same with the Sex Pistols. You know, that, that to my parents' generation and their parents who fought in the Second World War, that was that was a, a giant, you know, literally a gob in the face sometimes. <laughs> Imagine, yeah. <laughs> I never thought about it that way, but yeah, that's very true. <laughs> but yeah, man. How long have you been doing this for? Well, well it was, it, I would say I'm just trying to kind of put myself in the... Uh, back in the vortex when I was, uh, I was kind of... Um, a little bit of a loose cannon, which has been sort of five, six years ago, yeah, sort of six, seven years ago, maybe. Um, this studio was a hub of characters, as you called them earlier on. Um, you know, we were, we were having a good time, but I was, um, yeah, I was uh, living the lifestyle a bit too, uh, living the lifestyle a bit too much. Um, there, there were there were many there, there's many distractions around here. Um, should you wish to to get involved, and um, I just got involved a little bit um, a little bit too much, um, and it was it was um, detrimental to my health, wealth, and physical well-being, and uh, just decided that kind of going from quite a heavy intake it was probably quite dangerous. What I did was going from a quite heavy daily intake to literally nothing, you know. And um, the the physical the physical side of it's all right. Um, it takes a couple of weeks, and your body gets accustomed. It, it knows it's not going to get that combination of chemicals that it so enjoys. Um, 
but the, the, you think you're over it and then the mental, all the stuff, basically, you know, self-medication a lot of the time, drug taking or drinking is, is about suppressing your feelings and your subconscious. So obviously when you, when you stop, when you stop it, all that, all the doors become unlocked mm. to your subconscious, all sorts of stuff comes pouring out. It's a very, very strange time and um, it had been quite easy to kind of alleviate that by going back to, to where I'd started. Mm. So I thought, I'd, uh, you know, I, I've got too much to lose, and also I need something to focus my mind. And 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 it was, um, you know, I started sort of drawing for a bit, and then my mind would wander. But then I just, um, um, I don't know, I just thought of, of, of uh, you know, something reasonably easy, access easily accessible that that needs concentration. Just so, just I think I was in an art shop and just saw the lino, and thought. Yeah, I love that approach from him again. Um, R.I.P. to Andrew Everall, man. Just sad of even watching all this stuff. But yeah, I, I think the idea that, you know, he saw himself going off the rails. He saw that his career was getting impeded. He had a family. Um, he had too much to lose, that he said. Um, obviously, the, the idea that you've got all this talent and you're going to waste it just so you can get high with your friends isn't really the most worthwhile thing. And overall, I just think it's a commendable thing he was able to kind of, um, before it got too heavy, before it, his health really suffered, he decided to kind of pull the brakes on the whole uh, the ball tree lifestyle and um, navigate his kind of um, ex, you know his uh, creative energies into liner right liner printing which you know isn't the easiest thing to do even to pick up as an art form right um, you could probably sketch and maybe do oil paintings or watercolor or anything else but liner is probably the easiest thing to get into and he decided to do it because again it probably just switches off the brain so he's not thinking about other things and I and again as a as an addict I would I would definitely um ascribe to that sort of thing as well that's probably why i do i run so much right because it just turns off a part of your brain because all you're thinking about is just surviving you're, you're you're thinking about just not tripping over you're thinking about maintaining a pace you're thinking about getting to your destination it just kind of cuts off a certain part of your brain so that you know once you do have the aware of all to start thinking about your life you can do it with a clear head and yeah man um rip andrew everall thoughts and fears guide to his family and friends and Hope the dance music community comes around and just gathers around them and supports them in this tough, difficult time. And um, anyway, before I continue, I'll quickly nip off. I'll be back in two seconds. <laughs> So it's about that. I had to get some water. Yeah. Tight like squeezing yet. Yeah. Boom. There you go. Okay, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. Welcome back to the show. Um, if you listen via the podcast episode, you won't hear a difference. If you're watching via the YouTube, unfortunately, you will see a difference because you know what? You will see a difference. But anyway, let's continue on here. Um, what else we got to talk about here? Is that is that a little bit musty? Yeah, it's a little bit. There's a lot of light coming through here, isn't it? But you know. Getting up again will be long, is it? Oh, a lot of light coming through here, isn't it? Apologies, what can you do? Um, so, let's continue. What else is next on the list here that I want to speak about? Let's get through this. Let's get through this. I got to get through this. I got to get through this. What else I want to talk about on this list? Let's go through the... Yeah, let's, let's go straight to street news because there's loads of stuff to get on and talk about here. So, number one. Um, Tom Sachs' uh, Nike collection is dropping again, supposedly. I'm not sure why that is. Oh, what's, what's happening here? The internet is still not working for some reason. Let's quickly see if we can connect it here before we continue. Oh. Come on, hurry up, mate. You know, I'm just connecting my phone for now because this is getting on my nerves. Is it connecting yet? No? Do nothing? 
Pokemon Sun. Okay, bear with me two seconds whilst this just loads up because you know BT internet isn't the most um, compatible with my computer. It seems like at the moment it's weird because we did change it from um, Talk Talk. We had Talk Talk previously, and it was just probably one of the worst services we ever had. Um, dealing with the customer service line is just incredibly frustrating. Trying to get it to work is just non-existent. It just runs into problems all the time. Okay, we're finally back online. Finally, finally. Anyway, so. Tom Sachs is going to be re releasing his collection of Mars Yard. The, the, I think the Mars Yard 2.0, whatever the one, that massive big moon boot one that reminds me of something Little Wayne would wear. I'm a big fan of the actual shoe. I think it works really well. I remember seeing a picture of some girl on the street style picture. Maybe it might have been uh, Paris or something wearing a pair, and they looked amazing. Again, I think it's a bit of a cheat code uh, for girls when they wear those kind of shoes because primarily, or for the or primarily, for the most part, if you're a girl in your size, I don't know five and under and you wear any shoe even a foam posit that's probably one of the most ugliest shoes that ever exists right it will it will usually work pretty well on you right so i think this tom Sachs is a good example of it but again i'm, I'm happy they're re-releasing it I, i'm not too sure if it's because the first batch didn't sell too well but they do go for quite a bit of money on StockX still not crazy amounts not the same as not as much as the mars yards that i have which are somewhere around there you know where but yeah, not as much as the Mars Yards I have, but they do go for quite a bit of money. Um, so maybe, I don't know. I wonder why. This happened quite often, actually. There's been a few hyped shoes that have been dropping again. I'm not sure if it's because Nike make too many or it's because they just want to drum up the hype again. But it's not just, it's not how it used to be. I remember back in the day when you, they, Nike used to drop a tier zero, like an exclusive shoe. They drop this and then they'll make a, like a kind of a GR version of it. A version that just doesn't, you know, a version just for the just for people to use or a version that they're going to sell in like kind of a core stores like a foot patrol or something right a foot patrol is not a good example maybe like a size a, shoot, a place that gets like you know the, the the tier below tier zero but yeah i'm a big fan of this um i, I think it's up here on the screen now hopefully you can see this uh so it says here tom Sachs and nike craft transitions collections is set to release for a, set for a global wider release right so this transition collection i'm assuming is the big boots you got the backpack You've got another pouch and you've got something else like a hat thing sort of thing right with the 10 bullet symbol let's quickly get this out of the way here allow okay so um said so here from this is from hype beast uh originally uh, released um at the tom Sachs tea ceremony exhibition in tokyo the nike craft transit okay so it was only releasing tokyo okay i remember that do you remember that T tokyo's uh, tea ceremony um exhibition with all the amazing pieces of artwork that Tom Sachs Studio did, it was just really incredible to look at. I think I might have featured it previously on another podcast. Um, the Nike, uh, the Sachs uh, Nike Craft Transitions Collection is now set for a wider global release. Special range is centered around the transparency of materials and of construction, and according to Sachs, features the same value and integrity of sculptures that I make in the studio. The Nike Craft Transitions Collection was introduced globally by the Mars Yard Overshoe, leading the uh, apparel side of the collaboration is the research intensive exploding poncho the unique uh the unique the unique is constructed jesus christ writing of the same dynamina fabric used on the shoe the free layer waterproof breathable fabric while trinity case uh, features a sorry okay the writing is horrible so take a look at the tom Sachs nike craft transition collection available above it should be available february 15th so it's obviously out now and it should have probably been all snapped up already um let's a quickly look at the video here Exploring the poncho. Is this from NASA? Okay, sick. Little video here from Tom Sack Studio. The exploding poncho. Why do you want a poncho to explode, by the way? I'm not too sure about. I love how the videos are like, if you're familiar with Tom Sack Studio, you know that, um, I think, was it, was it Casey or was it his brother? I think one of them used to intern or work for Tom Sack back in the day. And I think this is where they got their style from, the sort of jump cut things, like with the zooming in and stuff. So when you watch loads of Tom Sack videos, it feels like a Casey Neistat video, basically. It feels like back in the day, old school New York Casey Neistat, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know why you want an expansive poncho. Okay, so it, it doesn't go over your head straight away like that, that's impossible. That's amazing. So for the people listening in the audio podcast, it's a lady that's on that's on a rooftop somewhere in the middle of New York. Um, and then she puts on a little uh, waist bag, clips it onto her waist, and essentially pulls these tabs or these strings for the front of it, and a poncho leaps out of the bag and 
um, obviously assembles itself on top of her. But it's like there's no way this poncho kind of falls on top of her with a hood up on her head. I'm sure that was a jump cut, but it looks pretty cool. And she's clipping it now to see the sides of the poncho. I think ponchos are a big thing because I think Supreme put, put one out recently too, right? In their Supreme 20, uh, in the spring summer 2020 preview, there's a poncho featured as well. I think they're popular in, in the New York because it's wet, right? Because they have rainy seasons and stuff. And I remember when we went in the summer, this was ages ago, it was our first sort of lads holiday. I do remember it raining a lot. Um, like flash, flash rain, flash storms, whatever they're called, right? And when it was, it, it was like, it was not like, you know, when you go to like a, you know, you go to like a foreign country and you have different kinds of weather and it's like nothing you've experienced at home. It was essentially like someone was just pouring a glass of water over top of us. It was just constant. So I'd imagine a poncho is quite handy in that kind of place. Like imagine every, most people have like one rolled up in their bag or they'll buy some of somebody outside of a station somewhere. That, that was always a dream I had actually, an entrepreneurship dream where one day I'd be off from work and it'll be raining somewhere and I'd have a whole box full of umbrellas for a quid, I'll just go and sell outside the station for one pound and shit. That'd be awesome, innit? Wow, so she takes it off, clips it back onto the bag again, and it folds back into the bag. So it pops out, but it doesn't fold, it doesn't pop back in. See, that's that's the thing. But that side bag looks incredible, man. I love it, man. So beautiful. I love his aesthetic, you know? The contrasting stitching and stuff. The fact that all the all the joinery and all the bits are exposed. It's just really, really cool. So yeah, big up um, Tom Sack Studios and Nike. Again, my, one of my most favorite collaborations, I think, of recent years. A very interesting collaboration overall. Like nothing you've ever seen out there. you got the original poncho here from Nike uh, with the NASA logo made in Vietnam. Classes on the back, nice and proud. Um, Everything folds up into itself. The waist bag with the poncho inside it. I'm assuming the waist bag, you can put the poncho in and you can also leave it out. I assume so. There's loads of other bags within bags as well. I like, like, look at this unnecessary, like, stuff like this with a clip on it, with a little paper clip. Like, I don't know. I, I love all the details that surround the stuff that Tom Sachs does. It's all really very, 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 very well considered. Um, nice little sketch on there or writing property of Tom Sachs. Da, 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 da. Again, it reminds me of Casey what, that he always kind of writes on his um, gadgets and stuff. Writes his name, phone number, and address in case someone finds it, they can return it. Uh, you're calling on the humanity of people isn't it, sometimes, isn't it? I guess all those digital products try and return it. But, you know, it's always nice if someone surprises you. A model here wearing the poncho with the shoes on. And it looked really good on, to be fair. The overshoe. It looks fucking beautiful. I know some people on social, I remember seeing people cutting off the uppers and stuff and making them so that you can see the... It's just bullshit. Like, if you're going to buy this shoe, buy it for what it is, isn't it? I never really got the understanding. Obviously, the, the closest thing that I did to that was maybe a skate high. Remember back in the day when you used to get skate highs? If, if you skate, you'd know that sometimes when you got a skate high, some people would cut the, the top collar off and make it into like a kind of a half cab. And then, of course, when half cab... No, make it into like a, a sort of like a mid a mid skate high, a mid skate high or whatever that one's called. There is It does exist, right? There's a skate high and there's a skate high that's kind of a mid. So you'd cut it so it looks that way. So a little bit higher than a, a half cab. Then, obviously, Van started making that shoe because people were cutting their skate highs. And there's no need to do it anymore, right? Um... Especially with Nike ID and stuff around, there's no need to kind of get a shoe and kind of cut it up to pieces so it fits into your um, requirements. Just get a Nike ID and make your own colorway, innit? But yeah, the poncho looks great. Um, nice little, what's that? Okay, that over shirt, that, that, that blue denim shirt is nice. Imagine if something Bill Cunningham would have worn. Um, I like the little hat as well. So cool. You can put a pencil in it, obviously, with the 10 bullets on the front motif. Yeah, all quality stuff from... Tom Sack Studios, man. I'm a fan of all of it. Oh, I love all this stuff. Look at this. It's like a pentagram. And it's got research, style, humor, um, irrationality, lust. What's that say? Rigor and intuition. Will in the middle. I love that. I love that idea. Yeah, you got these padded shorts that look mad. So if you want to get a back off, you can put those underneath a pair of jeans. And unless you've underneath your fashion over jeans, then you can look amazing. But yeah, I'm a fan of them. Again, the original shoe is still the best, you know. That Mars Yard is probably one of the best shoes that ever ever released, maybe in the last few years, mate. It's so beautiful. But yeah, uh, big up Tom Sachs, Nike Craft Transition Collection. Should be out now at all your relevant uh, stores, I'm assuming, right? Let's carry on here. Ba -ba -boo, ba -ba -boo. What else is on the list here? Let's see. 
Uh, Matthew Williams' second runway shoot. This is interesting, isn't it? Have you heard the rumour? Supposedly that Matthew Williams might be heading to Gucci. Matthew Williams of Elite's fame, supposedly. I've, uh, I saw a tweet from a Brian Boy speculating that he might be... He just he just put out a little a little feeler. Like, oh, is really Matthew Williams going to Gucci? Going to Givenchy, sorry. And now everyone's kind of wiling out in the comments. So that might be interesting, isn't it? I could really see him working well for Givenchy, especially if they're looking at it from the sense of kind of replicating or kind of building upon the Ricardo Tishi heyday, right? That kind of amazing era when he was like, you know, smash, you know, Rock Riley T era and stuff. That could be a good platform to, to do his thing. Especially if he decided to go to Givenchy and not reiterate and not kind of, uh, and not kind of make another interpret and not kind of build upon the buckle, the seat, the belt buckle thing. Imagine if he just left that behind or left that to a league send Dior. And he just built, and he just made something, another kind of harness that was just amazing, that blew everyone's mind. Because for all the stick he gets for the the seat belt buckle thing, like you have to remember that like, he was the only person that did that, right? That was the first time I ever saw that in fashion. Yeah, you could have bought the same thing on Amazon, but no one was doing. It. I remember Hiroshi Fujiwara was saying the same thing. Like people say they everything I do is easy or that they could do it, but they didn't do it, right? I did it first, so it's like yeah, that's where the skill comes in. The ability to take something mundane and then make it desirable. Yes, it was that kind of you know airport um airplane belt buckle thing is probably an idea that every person everyone that's kind of has taste or is into clothes or is into kind of fashion or is into streetwear would have had the idea of like oh this would work really good as a belt right when you're in your little when you're on your flight going somewhere right but then no one took the risk to kind of go home research it find a manufacturer get them to make it into a belt and actually make it work and then he obviously then went and did a bit of R and D and kind of designed his own belt buckle, which is kind of really unique, isn't it? I've got a bootleg version somewhere that I wear mostly. That's really nice, but I imagine the real version is probably even better. But anyway, um, back onto Matthew M Williams news. I'm liking that he's actually um, uh, Matthew M M M W that he's doing right. So it's sort of like building upon maybe the legacy of the kind of H T F um, Hiroshi Tinker and Fraser Cook um, platform, right? And sort of doing his own collaboration that way. And I also like the idea that all these new people, these new guys, they make they're really doing a good they really know, they really know how to like brand themselves. So I think Sammy Ross is doing the same sort of thing with a Cold War. So he's got his own studio, he does his own stuff under his own name. Then he's got obviously a Cold War. Then is obviously the poly polyurethane optics, whatever that name is called, for the kind of core streetwear stuff that he kind of gives to the kids, quote unquote, that can't afford it. And he actually does it for the kids. You remember back in the day when Virgil was always like, oh, I'm for the kids, I'm for the kids. And he'd sell you a rugby flannel with 23 print on the back of it for $500, right? Like, that wasn't for the kids, right? Even though, to be fair to Virgil, I think he's learned from that and he does go above and beyond to give unknown kids a platform, right? He'll get a stylist in that no one knows from Twitter to come and work on his show. He'll get some kids a designer graphic, right? He does give everyone an opportunity. But that early era of Off-White or Pyrex when he was kind of, um, basically using kids to kind of give himself clout was not the most tasteful but he's learned from it but I also like that someone like a Sammy Ross kind of backs it up you know he's got an actual line that's kind of like a, a subsidiary line that he uses to kind of pump product out to kids who don't have much money and I like the fact that Matthew Williams does the same thing with his brand and doesn't dilute it by kind of using a, a Leaks logo or a Leaks name and associating it with Nikes and stuff he kind of uses his own name and puts them on there and I think it's pretty cool and most of the stuff that he's doing with these MMW moniker has seems like it's kind of centered around um outdoors athletic fitness wear, which is quite interesting too, direction to go into, which kind of puts him in the same company as like a Jun Tak Takahashi, right? With a kind of Gayo Gayokusu, however you pronounce it, um collection, which maybe might be his overall vision. I always assumed I always kind of got the impression that Virgil and Matthew were framing their kind of careers around what Jun and Nigo kind of have done, right? The idea that they were able to kind of sit in both, maybe not, less so Nigo, more so Jun, he's able to sit in both areas of like fashion with a capital F and obviously streetwear. Um, I think that's something that, because um, he, he still does it, right? John on the cover. Does Jun still do that? John on the cover is basically the kind of, the, the kind of Uniqlo version of undercover for the lack of a better term. It's still quite expensive, but you still get the same aesthetic. They're still kind of the same, the, the codes, the same ethos, the same taste level, and one of those kind of clothing. Anyway, let's go back to Matthew Williams. He's got a new shoe here previewed from Hype Beast. It's the Matthew Williams teaser's up and coming Nike Zoom MW4, which is pretty interesting for a shoe. Um, again, weird sole. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a bubble there. I like the fact that it's kind of got this weird wraparound thing at the bottom. 
it looks like it's been constructed out of lava or something kind of reminds me of a ccp shoe maybe in that respect but i like the fact that it's a, i think it's an entirely new model i'm not too sure i haven't read the text here from hypebeast but it looks like it might be an entirely new model um mmw matthew williams here has, has taken uh, this article from um hypebeast i'm quickly going to read here for you guys um has uh, taken to instagram to further tease the up and coming nike zoom mmw sneaker previously unveiled at nike 2020 future sport forum the new set of images give us a better look at the shoes multiple mesh patterns panel sorry exaggerated heel and elongated opening representative of the heel tunnel found on nike shots gravity silhouette okay nice there's currently no official info on it but yeah it looks like an interesting shoe right so again he's taken a, a, a maybe a model that already exists and really gave it his matthew williams touch or a leaks kind of design ethic code it looks fucking incredible doesn't it is that like a pull tab i like the fact that it's got this mad tread that kind of wraps around underneath it you've got these insane pull tabs on it uh is that a bit of branding there well, oh yeah mmw here on the toe looks really Incredible MMW there too. I wonder who he's paying a homage to with the MMW because you could have easily just have it MMW, right? Matthew Williams, but he always goes by MMW. I wonder why. I wonder what the or M sorry, yeah, MMW. I wonder what the middle M is for. Maybe it's a leg, maybe something's paying homage to family or something, but it's quite cool. Um, the shoe looks pretty cool. Little video of him going on. Fuck, they look amazing. Whoa. <laughs> They look nuts. You see, you remember, I think I remember speaking to my friend about this, right? The thing I hate about fashion shoes, the thing I hate about people in fashion design trainers is that they try and just replicate what's already been out. They'll go to the archive and just try and pull out a 90s and 80s reference and just apply it to a shoe that already exists nowadays, right? What I would like to a fashion people to do, which is why I really like the Triple S, was that it was a fashion shoe. It was that their crazy interpretation of what a fashion shoe would look like. If you're going to be a fashion house or a fashion designer and use the resources of a sneaker company, don't don't waste it by just taking something from the archive or redesigning a colorway. Go there and actually use their design team, their research and development team, their materials, the testing to actually create something mad that you can never... Because I, I think I remember hearing from someone that has a brand that the actual most expensive thing to produce or to kind of manufacture is shoes, right? Because effectively you're having to make a last for each size, which is why most fashion companies don't do half sizes because the margins are just inc incredibly low. And obviously you're gonna have to pay a lot outlay. Uh, initially, I think is even worse than maybe clothing um, in terms of getting the molds done. So the fact that you can go into a Nike studio, you go to an Oregon, you can go to like an idea lab and work with those guys, people who have kind of studied this shit outside of the trend, just studied footwear design. And I can maybe make your thing come to life, right? It reminds me like of a scene of out of the car lab of a documentary where he's just sketching and he hands it to a seamstress and she just makes it. Like if you could do that in a fashion, in a, in your fashion company, take advantage of it and make something nuts. Cause this looks incredible, man. It looks wild. Fuck yeah, man. I'm all for it. I'm all for that shoot. That looks fucking insane. And again, it's a running, it's a performance shoot, right? It's like going to be a fitness running shoot that people are going to be able to wear. I'm definitely going to be into that, man. That looks nuts. Because again, when you go out and running, like everyone's wearing the same stuff. It's all the same sort of neons, same sort of silhouettes for the most part, chunky soul. Everyone's kind of making their version of a hookah, uh, of a hookah one one. Everyone's making their version of like a Nike Vaporfly 4%. So the fact that this looks nothing like those shoes is something I'm game for, man. Wow. No date of release so far, but um happy to see them. Let's go to Instagram quickly and check if he uploaded anything since that post. Because this has been a while back, but wow, they look beautiful. Nothing so far. Here, there he is standing with the boss, obviously. Man like HF. I would like that one because, you know, he's a legend. Jesus Christ. Amazing. But yeah, big up, big up, big up, big up, big up um uh, matthew for just making amazing stuff man just amazing stuff he's really killing with the leaks and if the Givenchy rumors are to be re are to be re believed then he's going to be a great addition um to that legacy to that storied house I and mean, hopefully we'll see um uh, another side of him what else he can do in that regard because i think he's kind of aced this kind of luxury luck streetwear kind of um field maybe the next kind of avenue is to go uh, high fashion with a capital f in it who knows Next on list here, we have Fear of God for Zegna talking about high fashion with a capital F. Man, this is a crazy news, isn't it? I didn't, I didn't wear, I didn't, I'm not sure where this came from, but it it seems to make sense, I reckon. Um, so supposedly, um, Jerry Lorenzo from Fear of God, he's gonna do a collaboration or a capsule collection for uh, Zegna, which is really cool. I think it's part of maybe Milan Fashion Week, so it probably might have already dropped. 
I'm going to quickly just read the caption here and then go through his Instagram and see if it's posted anything. But it looks pretty cool. I'm liking what he's doing now with the facial hair and the braids. I think it looks awesome. And Iverson style. Um, but yeah, a very un unsuspecting um, collaboration. But something, if you think about it carefully enough, it does make a lot of sense. I always kind of got the impression that he was maybe fo following maybe the Vizim approach of stuff, like where essentially um, a lot of uh, Fear of God's uh, staples a lot of the stuff that Jerry Lorenzo wears himself personally has come from his own need, right? So he's had a hole in his wardrobe. He's always needed like a, a particular hoodie that fits a certain way, a particular kind of trainer, a certain style, right? And he just goes out there and basically makes something that he would want to wear. And obviously because he has a, a, a particular sense of style that I think fits very well in the kind of... I'd imagine somebody that wears Fear of God, you don't want to be overly... Uh, bedazzled and fashiony, like maybe an Amiri, right? And you don't want to be overly mundane or overly bland, like maybe a Com or a Rick, maybe I don't know, like a black monochromist type brand. But you also want to look like you spent money on your clothing. So the best way to do it is maybe to buy a Fear of God, right? Where a bomber will look like is it, his bombers look like they might be a bomber you could buy from an army surplus store. But when you look closely at the details, you'll be like, okay, cool, this is designed by somebody, right? The length of the arms, the cuffs, the zips that he uses uh the the ribbing on the on, on on the waist like everything has been considered the lining where the pockets sit so i guess that maybe would fit in maybe similar to um what zegna trying to do so this is an instagram post from the select the man it says uh it immediately got a man nearly gildo zegna right join forces with fear of god for fall 2020 earlier today we learned that zegna will be collaborating with fear of god founder joe lorenzo uh, the Cray Partnership presents an opportunity to merge Zegna's tailoring with the expertise of Fear of God's elevated streetwear. So I, I like the fact that he's still using the, the streetwear moniker. He's still flying high with it, even though everyone in fashion now is kind of poo-pooing streetwear and be like, oh, let's get those guys with the snapback hats and the skateboards out of here. <laughs> and they, no, actually, they, they, fashion people love skateboards because fashion women, especially models and street and photographers and stylists, they love sleeping with skate young skateboarders, right? Anytime London Fashion Week comes to town, you know all the hot skater guys are, you know, tearing it up in, you know, literally, you know, they're having to mop after themselves after they leave hotel rooms in London. But um, when it comes to streetwear people, they're not that fond of it. So this collaboration seems pretty cool. Let's read the caption here. Uh, we've got here, uh, I'm assuming Jerry looking at a mood board somewhere in the Milan studios of Zegna thinking, my God, what a great opportunity. Um, is it a video from it? Is it a video or is it just a little caption? Okay, so the way things continue. So, uh, Fear of God, uh, exclusive of Zegna. This is a quote from Jerry Lorenzo. It says here, Fear of God is crazy. Cre Fear of God's creative endeavors are first birthed from a place of purpose and honesty. That's how he talks, right? With a shared true desire to create the modern man's wardrobe. We partnered with Americano Zegna to establish a timeless connection rooted in freedom, sophistication, and elegance. Through this partnership, we've had an opportunity to bring our pers perspective of the American luxury to the hands of craftsmanship of Italian's best tailors. And honestly, I think it's going to be amazing because already they do. Um, some people do. Some people argue that um, Fear of God is very overpriced, which I don't necessarily agree with. But for what it's worth, for, for the price that he charges, like the quality is insane. If you've ever touched a Fear of God stuff in a, in a kind of department store or in a retail store somewhere, you actually see it in real life, you know how good that stuff feels in your hand. It's so, so lovely. The, especially the t-shirts, some of the pod shorts that they made. He's really taken like staple stuff that he's always always worn. Like maybe he's he's been a fan of a particular drop coach um, Rick pan that he probably wanted to update or a pair of basketball shorts or a nice hoodie. He just really makes them in a really clever way. Um, here's a quote from someone from Zegna, which is Alessandro Sartori. My design studio in Zegna is an ongoing experimental laboratory where we merge innovation, craft, and techniques to con I sound like Dracula, isn't it? <laughs> to conceive the garments, uh, starting designing the fabrics. Uh, Zegna and Fero God uh, are both inspired by the same sentiment uh, towards a unique uh, classmanship, giving life to a new form of hybrid elegance and independent style. I now sound kind of Indian, isn't it? My accents are horrible. But yeah, um, big up Jerry, man. I've, is there a post on this on his Instagram about what's going on with this collaboration? It sounds insane. Well done to the guy, isn't it? Is that him at church, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's probably a church thing. What's not? So there's not, nothing in it right here. The weight of a black man. The the, the, the IP pot smoke. Um, yeah, nothing. Oh, look at the look at them. Look at the family decked out in Jerry and Rick coats. Woo hoo hoo! You got. I've got to like that. Their families are cute, isn't it? 
but yeah, pick up Jay Lorenzo, man. What a great collaboration. Um, I hope to see more of it coming up very, very soon. PSA sponsored by Zegna. I wonder if you're going to see any more of it, actually. I, I haven't seen it, man. I've not seen it. His personal style is pretty decent, isn't it? To be fair, isn't it? He does dress very, very well. Has to be said. Man like Zegna does dress very, 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 very well. I mean, man like Joe Lorenzo, sorry. I like his outfits. Very calm, very easy on the eye. Got those little uh, backless slipper heel things that a lot of Asian students like to wear. But yeah, um, not so, we don't have any information on what it looks like so far. But yeah, big up him regardless, isn't it? Big up him regardless. I love, I love, you love to see it. You really do love to see it. So let's move on here. Uh, Hiroshi Fujiwara, my god, my idol, my um, somebody that I've kind of looked up to in terms of framing where I want to go in terms of streetwear. This is kind of in terms of goals, right? I'd say DJ goals, obviously, a Gerd Jansen, obviously, a Dixon with Innovision label. Gerd, in terms of just doing running back quietly and running that, a Dixon, in terms of building a complete empire, right? Innovision, muting the noise, um, uh, you know all those good stuff that he does, right? And then he works for Juara in terms of just like his approach to streetwear and fashion. The fact that he's able to kind of go and sit front row at Mew Mew show and then go and collaborate with Vli Lone and then go and do a collaboration with Hublot and then do a club brand partnership or sponsorship with Starbucks. That's the perfect career for me. That's a, that's a real um, platform to really showcase your expertise in create your expertise in not creativity, but your expertise in art and design like how can you apply your skill set to these different planes right it's it's my kind of version it's i think the streetwear version of do you remember that that story that uh of kobe bryant going playing pickup basketball in rucker park in the rain and murking everyone right the fact that he didn't want to leave right that 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 epic story like like nba players going to play pickup basketball in, in a hood and be like nah nah nah, nah. I know, I know you see me doing the NBA thing where we're protected and there's no fouling and there's no rough play and shit, but I can do this too, right? I can play in, on, all, on all planes. And that's essentially what Hero Should Euro does, right? Starbucks, Hublot, V-Loan, you know, wherever, some under, some something that he hasn't put his name towards. It's just all really perfect. And again, does it all in his, a beat of his own drum. I think he has like, what, three full-time employees or maybe two? Like, such an incredible thing to, like, he was doing, he was doing that kind of independent sort of like, um, outsources design thing before it got trendy right you know because i think the, the person that really blew it up was maybe a kylie with a cosmetic line people started to think oh wow she's doing a whole thing off a laptop with like five employees because most of the stuff has been outsourced right because nowadays you can do that packaging uh shipping logistics operations can just be outsourced to some other people you just run it all from a laptop and i guess who else does the same sort of thing but i also like the fact that he's able to do collaboration with Nadi. Hey, that's maybe not so much. I'm not seeing any issue, but he's able to do sportswear collaborations with more brands than just Nike, which goes to show, you know, just how well respected he is in the industry. Anyway, my uh, Hiroshi Fujiwara uh, wanking session over. There's a really cool article here from Hype Beast that says he's now re- teasing um, a new Air Force One high that he's designed that looks very much like a Hiroshi Fujiwara shoe. Very Japanese influence, very Tokyo influence, very tasteful. And again, a proper Marmite approach without being garish. That's the thing that I'll, I'm, I'm glad that he does. He'll re-release a Nike All Court, right? Get that from the retro um, archive and re-release it. But then he will just make it in like really basic colorway. So it's up to you to decide as a punter, as a consumer, do I like it or not? He's not going to sell you a colorway based. He's not going to sell you a shoe based on a colorway. Because a lot of shoes can get away with stuff because of the colorways they choose. Like a phone pod is a good example. You, you slap any colorway apart from the OGs on the phone posit, automatically it's a, it's a dud. That supreme phone posit, a dud. The OGs, okay. Still not going to wear them, but fine. But any other color on the phone posit is dud because the shoe itself is shit. So I, f- I like the fact that he's able to kind of get a good shoe and then tweak it slightly, ever so slightly, just to kind of make it his own. And this Air Force One is a good example of it, right? So there it is. It's an Air Force One high with Velcro straps, no laces. Who would have saw that coming, right? Uh, again, I think the Air Force One model is a model. I think the shape wise, I think I remember Celine doing a pair. Do you remember Celine doing a pair of Air Force Ones, right? Uh, from Phoebe Philo's era, Celine Air Force One. It was like an Air Force One shoe. So I think that model is so well loved and so well received and so well liked by most people in the industry because of just the, the chunkiness of it, the versatility of the shoe, that everyone's got their own version of it, right? This is the Celine version. I remember coming out a few years, seasons, a few, well, when Phoebe Fowler was still there. And it's essentially what you can see from this, which is what I love about design, which is why I need to have my own brand. The fact that 
we've all had this idea. Like I remember the big thing about vans back in the day was the fact that they had the piping, right? Look, the piping line, the little blue line that goes around the midsole. And everyone was like kind of trying to color it in or dye it out. And then, um, of course, what happens over time is that once you start wearing a pair of Vans Authentics and you get the foxing off or you uh, take off the piping, you might then think, you know what? I wish the sole was a couple of inches thicker. I wish the insole was like this. I wish the heel tab was like that, the laces, the eyelets, right? And then suddenly now you're making your own shoe and you're putting it out there and that turns into common projects, right? That's where common projects started from. The idea that these guys wore, would, would they, they work in professional environments where they just want to have one shoe that they can wear day in, day out from meetings to, um, you know, to all hands, to client uh, briefings, to just working day to day. That's not going to break down, and you just make a, a common a, 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 a common project Achilles, right? And suddenly you got this amazing shoe that lasts forever, and people are big fans of it. And I think if you follow iteration of the Air Force One, the similar sort of thing, right? So you've taken a, a a classic silhouette, something that you think really works, but just updated it in your in your way, right? So the paneling has changed. Um, it's like I don't know what that seam is called when it's not kind of stitched over, sort of like underneath. I'm not sure what that's called, but really luxe leather. I think the sole has been thickened ever so slightly, or maybe the insole or the instep has kind of been sunken deeper to kind of give it the impression that it's a bit of a thicker sole. And again, just a very classic shoe with the strap on it works really well. And I'm assuming this did really well for the company when they when they sold them at the time. And Rich Fajura has done the same sort of thing with the Air Force One. He's taken a shoe that he think works really well for his kind of personal style and just updated it ever so slightly. So maybe he's kind of and again, maybe for the most part, if you listen to Fiorentino, everything's all matter of factly, or everything's all matter of fact. So it might just be that he just he's getting older now, and he doesn't want to keep having to relace his shoes. So he just made a sh and and the shoe that he wears more often than not is an Air Force One day to day, and he just made this incredible shoe, which has the inside swoosh has sort of been unpicked in there. So just the outline of it, you've got the essential. Um, fragment hill tab with the Thunder logo on the back and then you've got three straps here in the front it looks like the toe box has been changed slightly too there's a little kind of mud guard here in the front a little kind of clipping which is different than most Air Force Ones but again it looks fucking beautiful man I'm a big fan of it again I think if Velcro shoes have got a bad rep in Europe or in the UK or in other places right people have like quite you know people kind of ascribe the r word to velcro shoes but i think any other any other place people see velcro shoes as like a real big convenience right the fact that you can wear something and just slip it on without the hassle of having to kind of relace them is quite advantageous um but yeah what a what a great idea for a shoe again considering that Hiroshi Fujiwara has a key to the nike archive and you can do whatever the fuck he wants the fact that he does this is just really really incredible like super confident in his uh ability to uh ideate to create and want to connect to people and in terms of like selling shoes um again maybe not selling shoes because I, I don't think if you're in Russia, you get into this stuff to like oh, i want to sell out you just want to make a shoe that you think you vibe with and hopefully it's going to contribute something to the scene isn't it because you look back at all these stuff he's done with h or he's done with fragment they've all been wins in it for the most part there's not been one dud in there i don't think um so yeah big shoe no idea when it's going to come out actually there's no date on there but again, I'm loving it, man. I think it looks bloody amazing. Big, big fan of it. So a bigger paycheck for that shoe. Can't wait to see when that drops very, very soon. Hopefully soon enough. Um, let's move on here. Ba ba ba. Oh, let's let's end it with this. Travis Scott um dunk SBs. I've been a bit on the fence with the whole dunk thing. I don't think it's gonna last. I think it's a dud. I think everyone kind of buying dunks now and trying to you know, um, bump artificially bump up the value of shitty dunks that I had that I sold because they don't drop well with trainers or jeans. Now it's better because people are wearing flared jeans or they're editing their jeans to make them a bit bigger at the bottom. Fair enough, but it's not really something I'm really vibing with. I'm not really a big fan of. I don't really think it looks that good personally, in my humble opinion. Um, but again, it's good. To, it's cool to see that. I'm not just sure if it's organic either. That's the thing that's really kind of paining me. I think I don't like to be hoodwinked. I don't like to be um, marketed to. So I'm not sure sure if this is like a concoct a plan that they've devised in Nike offices to kind of bring them back in vogue, or if this is something that just happened organically. But anyway, regardless of that, um, the Travis Scott dunk lows are very very nice. Like they really remind me of the he heady um, uh, old school era of the kind of silver box Nike SBs, um, which you, if you're familiar with them back in the day, you would know what I'm talking about. They they wouldn't look out of place if they saw them in Sam City Skates back in the day. They look really nice. So you got this kind of like blue paisley print. With this kind of brown uh, check pattern, um, these really weird cord hemp laces, just really kind of you know 
Avert. Travis Scott aesthetic, right? A little bit dusty, a little bit brown, a little bit green, a little bit blue. Uh, just some real kind of um, rough vibes on the upper, but again, done in a very tasteful way. I'm not sure if there's a secret pouch in it like he did in, in most of his Jordans, but I, I'm liking the color placements. I'm liking the patterns. I'm liking the fact that he kind of is persisting with this kind of brown and pink theme, which maybe is his kind of two favorite colors that he wears quite often. Um, and yeah, I'm a big fan of them, man. I think they look really, really impressive. Again, they're going to sell out like hotcakes. They're going to be reselling for a lot of money so if you're gonna buy a pair definitely try and get on them very quickly but i think as an approach for the dunks that i've seen coming out so far i'm liking i'm probably not a fan of the whole dunk revival if they're just gonna re-retro every dunk that we wore back in the day when we were younger it's just annoying it's just there's no need for that but if they're gonna do new ones and maybe get some of the newer generation kids out there who are now buying trainers to kind of uh interpret oh, how do you re how do you reinterpret this shoe that you probably didn't give a shit about because the thing with a dunk that would work for you especially a dunk high because it looks quite similar to a Jordan 1, you could, in theory, get those same customers that wear, like, ripped jeans and, you know, uh, BB Simon belts and that kind of aesthetic, right? You could get those kids to maybe transition to a, a dunk high. You probably could, if you're clever with it, right? Do the right collaborations, the right GR releases, and suddenly it could blow up. But if you're just going to re-release stuff, it's not worth it. But if you're going to re-release stuff, if you're going to put out some old school dunks, right, for the sake of it, and again, this isn't an SB, so please forgive me for my sins, but if you're going to do it, then please, for the love of God, please, for the love of God, put out my most favorite dunk of all time, a dunk that I've been pining to get a hold of myself. I was actually considering doing an, a Nike ID of these and making them look similar, but, you know, I didn't want to cheat myself. If you're going to bring out another shoe, please bring out this dunk high um, for else. They're so beautiful. Or the NERD, sorry, from back in the day. Like, you know, all black upper, uh, grey silver swoosh with an ice sole on the bottom and red laces. Absolutely beautiful shoe. Like one of the most underrated dunks, I think, out there. Again, maybe not underrated because they go for big bucks on StockX, I'm still sure. But they are so fucking beautiful. Like, what an incredible, incredible, incredible shoe. Um, I think I missed out on these maybe about a couple of years, I think. I wasn't really aware. No, I don't think they came out as a GR. I'm pretty sure they were like a friends and family only. I'm pretty sure. I wonder how much they're going for now in StockX. <gasps> Free grand. Oh, okay, cool. So yeah, these are well, 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 well outside. If you will ask, let's see if they got my size in them. They're fucking beautiful though, man. They're so, so nice. Um, Oh, you got to log in first, isn't it, right? Can you just look at the size and see how much they're selling them for? No, arcs available. Cool last okay none, none none available in that size but yeah beautiful shoe regardless last one sold for 900 quid it looks like but yeah um again if they i'm not sure when they're meant to drop rumored to be at 150 dollars they're going to drop at when including they said to release on okay the end of the month end of february okay that's pretty cool so keep an eye on them if they're available uh if you want to resell you probably be able to make some good money if you want to wear some shoes then they'll probably look amazing when they start getting worn and beating up a bit you start getting some creases on them is that like a new buck what is that like a denim denim maybe it's top of, i don't know but yeah good shoe i like it like what he's doing big up travis um so far so good in that collaboration isn't it and that's where i think we'll end it Thank you so much again for tuning in to Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 283, with me, your host, Agostino. As per usual, if you want more regarding myself, you want to read my blog, you want to check out my DJ mixes, check out some of my stuff on social, please follow me, agostinozinger.com. If you want to follow me on social media, then do that, agostinozinger at Instagram and agostinozinger on Twitter. Um, if you want to subscribe to the podcast to hear my little jingle at the beginning, please do so. It's at the bottom there. You can subscribe via Apple, subscribe via podcast at the Axel Zinger Show. Find him on all your podcast platforms. And until then, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Bye. Peace. Sayonara.